Okay, so um, so yeah, Romans Romans 13, and um, I'm just going to read this morning from verse um, verse 11 down to verse 14. It says, Do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Well, let's just, let's just pray and ask the Lord's help as we consider his word together this morning. Gracious Father, we thank you again that, Lord, we can open these scriptures, we can open your word. And Lord, we, we know that's what it is. It is the word of God inspired by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Lord, that's our faith. That's what we believe. Indeed, Lord, we know it to be true. Your word is truth. And Lord, I thank you that your word is so incredibly up to date. Lord, some people seem to think that because these things were written so long ago, they would uh, have no relevance whatsoever to, to our lives today. Father God, we find the opposite is true. That, that Lord, this is uh, uh, bang on up to date and, and absolutely relevant to our life today. And so, Lord, we ask for the help of your Holy Spirit now. We pray that he will come move upon this written word upon our hearts and minds and speak into our lives the things that lord uh, are, are beneficial and relevant for our, our life right now at this point in time in which we find ourselves difficult times that we're living in but lord we we look to you for guidance lord i know that the world are looking to to politicians and looking to others so-called scientists for for, for guidance as to what to do uh, and uh, what they can do and what they can't do. But Lord, we, we look to you and I pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us. Give us understanding of your word this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the night is far spent, it says. The day is at hand. And, and that's really the title I've given to, to, uh, to this message this morning. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. And uh, truth is, as I thought about what I should uh, preach on this morning, I thought that maybe I would I would continue with a kind of Christmas theme, and maybe maybe preach on um, on a, a, another passage, one of one of the birth narrative passages from Matthew's Gospel or or the beginning of Luke's Gospel. You know, something about the events surrounding the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's so much in that, you know. There really is. And, um, but then I was drawn back to this passage in Romans 13 that we, we've been looking at for, for the last uh, a few weeks. And it seemed to me that, that this is so appropriate for today. It really is. Since this is the last Sunday of, of uh, 2021, and, and particularly because of where we are with everything that is happening right now, in the world, everything that is happening right now in our lives, with the situation as it is, you know what I'm talking about, the situation that we're all facing. I, I just think that this is so absolutely relevant to where we are up to right now. You know, the year 2021 is far spent and a new, a new year is at hand, if you want to look at it that way. 2021 is far spent, a new year is at hand. A new year that I feel certain is going to present us with some serious challenges. Of course, it may be that the Lord will come before the new year begins. Please, Lord. You know, that's what I would prefer, that the Lord come. I prefer that he come now before I even get going, <laughs> going with the, this message. That's, that's my desire. That's my heart's desire. And I know it is yours too. We are a church that love the Lord's appearing. And, you know, you know interestingly, you know, a, pro, a, a reward is promised for those who love his appearing. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Yeah. A crown is promised to those who love his appearing. And you, you would think to yourself that all believers would love his appearing, would love the thought that Jesus would come. But I don't know about you, but I've encountered believers for whom that is not so. Who would say, well, 
of course, you know, we want the Lord to return, but not yet. You know, not, not yet, eh, because I've got things that I, I want to do. The perspective's wrong if you're thinking like that. There could be nothing better than for the Lord to appear now. We would find ourselves in his presence, in the presence of glory that you can scarce imagine. I tell you, when you see him face to face, you will not be thinking, oh, I wish he'd have given me another three years. <laughs> you will not be thinking that. And do and you know what? With what is happening in the world right now, I dare say one of God's purposes, because you know he's in control, don't you? One of God's purposes is stripping away some of those things that we were clinging to so that, so that we're all the more ready to receive him when he comes. Anyway, he may well come before 2022 begins or it may be that the Lord will come in the year 2022. It might be the year that he comes for us. After all, as it says here in verse 11, now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, that is the day of his appearing. This is what we were thinking about in our message last Sunday. The day is at hand. And I know that there are Christians who say, yeah, but he wrote that nearly 2,000 years ago. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote that. It was nearly 2,000 years ago. And here we are after all this time. People who think like that ought to beware, you know, that they don't end up among the scornful, the scoffers. Second Peter chapter 3. He talks about the scoffers in the last day who say, so where is this appearing then? Things continue as they ever did before. Believer, you should be, if they think like that, you should be careful that you don't end up amongst the scornful and the scoffers. If, if, if Paul the Apostle, 2,000 years ago, thought that his appearing was soon, the day of our salvation is nearer than when we first believed, then it's nearer now than it was then. That, that's how you ought, ought to be looking at it. Okay, but whether the Lord comes for us or whether we have to remain a while longer and face various trials, well, that's in the Lord's hands. The question we need to ask ourselves, I think, as believers, is what should we do? How, how should we be? How should we live in view of these things? Uh, again, as the Apostle Peter put it in, his second epistle in chapter 3. He put it this way, he said, what manner of persons ought we to be in view of these things? That is a question we ought to ask ourselves. Because, you know, I, I know that prophecy, especially prophecy regarding the Lord's uh, coming, can be fascinating. It fascinates me. I've, I've loved the subject for years. You know, and, and you, can, you can kind of know what all the different views are about all of this and you can be convinced of your view and you've got you know x number of reasons why you hold the position you hold but you know if you're not careful it can all be a theoretical thing that people like to talk about is it pre-millennialism is it post-millennialism is it a millennial well i know what it is but you, you know you you can end up arguing with because it can become an intellectual exercise but it's never meant to be an intellectual exercise folks it's, it's meant to be something that excites us, something that makes us have a deep longing to see the Lord, but also something that spurs us on to godliness. You know, what manner of persons ought we to be in view of these things? You know, the, the, the Apostle John puts it this way in, um, in his first epistle, and, uh, and chapter 3, where, um, where John says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. In other words, if you've really got that hope within, within you, that should purify you. Because, you, you know, the way we should be thinking is like this. Jesus could come today. So therefore, what, what do I want to be found doing when Jesus comes back? That's the question we should ask ourselves. And if, and if you're serious about that, that should spur you on to godly living. Think about it. What, 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 what am I going to be doing when Jesus, when Jesus returns? So, so, 
this is, I, I believe, is what the Lord would, would have us um, consider this morning. So let me read again these verses. Do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Therefore, it says in verse 12, in other words, in view of this, in view of the fact that the day is at hand, there is something we must do, people. And we must do it now. We must do it now. There's no more time for drifting. Some Christian, I'm not accusing anybody here, but a, a, a lot of people tune into this on the on the, the internet. And the truth is this, there are some Christians who've drifted for years in the Christian life. They drift in and they drift out, and that's the way it goes, round and round and round, drifting. But you know, I put it to you, there is no more time for drifting or backsliding, if you want to call it that. There's, there's no more time for messing about or playing at being a Christian. And honestly, I don't think there's any time left for that now. No. Neither is there any time for playing with the world as Christian believers. It's over. There's no more time for playing at being a Christian or playing with the world. It's too late for any of that. Should never have been doing any of that anyway. But it's definitely too late now. Neither is there any time, any more time for faltering between opinions. You know, is it this or is it that? Or what, you know, there's no more time for that. I, I think it's too late. We've got to get our message straight now. We've got to make our mind up now what we are. You know, again, I, I know Christians, it seems to me, I'm not, I'm not being unkind, I'm certainly not out to criticise anybody. I mean, I'm useless myself at something. But, the, but the, the trouble is, you know, there are some, there are some Christians who can't seem to make the mind up what they are or where they want to be. Do you know, do you know I, I just put it to you, it's too late for any of that. Now, it's, it's make your mind up time. Because je either Jesus is coming very, very soon, I believe that, but I also believe that the, the pressure is now on and the pressure is going to be turned up in these, in these coming weeks and months if the Lord tarries they're going to turn up the pressure and there's no more time for mucking about <laughs> you know that, that's over it's decision time got to make your mind up who you are what you are and where you want to be the night is far spent folks the day is at hand therefore this is what you have to do. This is what I have to, this is what we have to do as believers. This is what we must do. Therefore, it says, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Well, let's just quickly go to the armor of light. I know I talked about this the other Sunday evening in, in one of those messages. But you know, by the armor of light, I'm, I'm taking this to mean the armor of God. You, you, you know, so so if we if we quickly look at Ephesians and uh, chapter six, and and again I say the same thing. You know, Christian believers should always have the armor of God in, but if, on. But if there was ever a time we need the armor of God on, it's now. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Let's just stop there for a minute. You see, some, some people, I, I've heard people talk about, you know, should we not like, you know, because of everything that's happening now and the things that they are doing, you know, should we not be like taking direct action? Should we not be going, you know, and, you know, no, because th this is a spiritual war. It's not a physical war. Don't go and, you know, 
bomb 10 down in street or whatever, ain't gonna make any difference. That won't help. You, know, you will all get a machine gun out. and uh, we, You cannot fight this war that way. Protest all you like. Well, this is a spiritual war, and we're, we're dealing with spiritual hosts of wickedness here. And therefore, you've got to fight that way. You've got to spy, fight with spiritual weapons. So it says, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplications in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints so this is the armour of God the belt of truth I'm not going to be expounding on this but truth it doesn't mean Make sure you tell the truth always. It doesn't mean you do that, of course, tell the truth. Last thing you want to be known as is a liar. But that's not the truth. That this, is, this is talking about the truth. This is talking about this, God's truth. And it's saying, let truth be a belt that holds everything together in your life. The truth. You've got to be men and women of the truth. You've got to be people of the word, in other words. Because it's all lies out there. I'm not just talking about the pandemic and all of that, but I'm talking about everything. It's a world full of lies and deceitfulness, this. We need to be men and women of truth who know God's truth. So we've got to get, a, get to grips with God's truth and make it a priority in our life. The belt of truth holds everything together. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness... You know, let me just say, you need to understand the doctrine of justification by faith. And if that sounds rather dull, it isn't. No. It's a, an understanding of the doctrine of justification of, by faith is vital. Amen. You see, some people think breastplate of righteousness. That means I've got to be a righteous person. You know, I've got to be good in it. And so, so whenever the devil comes, I'll be able to say, have you seen how much I've improved? <laughs> have, you, have you seen how much, how, how good a person I've become? If I tell you something now, if you try that one, you are, you are finished. Because he knows about more skeletons in your cupboard than you do. So, so he'll just simply say to you, you think you're good, what about when you said that? Or what about when you thought that? And what about your feelings in your heart towards that brother or that sister or that person? And what about that bad word that you said or thought? And he'll be able to point to any of it. Don't point to your own righteousness. The, your breastplate of righteousness is the righteousness of Christ with which you are clothed. It's the righteousness in which God accepts you because the blood of Christ made, made full atonement for all of your sin. And so he accepts you as righteous for Christ's sake because of what was accomplished at the cross he accepts you already as justified and righteous that's what you point to and so when the devil comes along you know what it says in, in Revelation 12 they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony what's that? it's when he comes along and says you miserable sinner look what you just did you don't say, I don't know, do it. I didn't do it. You don't say that. You say, you're right. I did. But the blood of Jesus cleanses from all unrighteousness. And I'm justified by the precious blood of Jesus. And I'm clothed with the garments of his righteousness. That's the word of your testimony. You overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. It's a breastplate of righteousness. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You've got to know the gospel, you know, so that at any given moment, in any given day, if somebody comes to you and says, tell me why you're a Christian, or tell me, what, what is this being saved? What's that all about? Straight away, you can tell them simply the, the gospel. It's there, ready, waiting. And you know, it's easy to do. All you've got to do is get yourself a good gospel tract, a good gospel tract that lays out the way of salvation in a few steps, learn it. 
and then it'll always be there and your feet will be well shod. And it's not only about telling other people that, by the way. It's about telling yourself. When, when he comes and shoots his arrows of doubt in your mind, you always point back to the gospel. Feet well shod with the preparation of the gospel. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Now, I'm not talking about that faith of the, of the health, wealth, and prosperity word of faith movement. That's some kind of thing that you've got to summon up, you know, and if you can have enough of it, well, you can have a, a new car or a, a new yacht or whatever. That's not, no, no, that's not it. That's not a faith. That's faith in faith. Our faith is in Christ. And, 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 and by that shield, we can quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. When he shoots at them at you, you hold up. The sh it's your faith in Christ. Christ has done it all. Christ has accomplished it all. You know, he comes along and he says, yeah, but it works as well. You know, you've not done enough good works. No, no, no. No, my faith is in Christ. The finished work of Christ on the cross. You know, that's it. That's my faith. You know, yeah, but what about the future? What might happen? You know, these are the doubts he puts in your minds. What if it all goes pear-shaped? What if it all goes wrong? What if, what if somebody gets the better of you? You know, you say, no, 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 no. Jesus is coming again. That's my faith. He's coming again. He's going to take me home. See, it's faith. Faith in Christ every time. That's your shield. Helmet of salvation. Well, the helmet pr protects the brain. And the brain is where your reasoning faculties are. So you've got to know the way of salvation. You've got to understand the rudiments of salvation. And that protects your mind from everything. And the sword of the Spirit, it's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. So you see, when you look at it, the armour of light, it's all about the Word of God. So we've got to be clothed with the armour of light. But it says, cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armour of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Okay, now I, I guess if, if, uh, if the Apostle Paul had just said, let us put off the works of darkness and left it at that, it, it, it might be that a lot of believers would just say to themselves, well, I've already done that. I mean, the works of darkness, what's that? Is that not like, you know, Satanism and all that kind? That's the works of darkness, isn't it? Well, of course it is. But the works of darkness is more than witchcraft and Satanism and, and all of this. This is talking about the works of darkness. And, um, you know, here the apostle sort of qualifies the statement by giving us some examples of which the, there could be many more he gives us some examples of the works of darkness and he talks about revelry drunkenness lewdness lust envy strife these are samples if you like of what constitute the works of darkness and the fact is friends that for many people anyway this time of the year, more than any other time of the year, provides the opportunity for all these things, doesn't it? Think about it. Revelry and drunkenness and lewdness and lust and envy and strife. This time of year, that for Christians, is all supposed to be about, you know, focusing on Christ. You know, it, 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 it can somehow, the whole season has been turned into these things but Paul calls them the works of darkness in fact the season almost seems to normalize all of this stuff it's what's expected at this time of year and, and as a matter of fact over the last few weeks when everybody's you know been a bit worried about whether they cancel Christmas again you know I suppose I suppose for a lot of people the the, the main worry was that if they cancel Christmas again, they're not going to be able to get involved in any revelry and drunkenness and, you know, lewdness and lust and, <laughs> and, and, and all of that. You know, if they cancel Christmas, whoa, we're going to be stuck at home again. You know, and, that, <laughs> and that's what's been a worry for, for a lot of people, I guess. And you see, professing Christians 
can actually get drawn into that, surprisingly. Professing Christians can get drawn into that sometimes without realising, but it can be drawn into it. You know, and, and, and I mean, Christians, of course, argue about, you know, whether or not it's okay for Christians to drink alcohol, or, you know, whether that's okay or not. And then, then so, the, the, you know, people have the discussion, and then, of course, the next part of the discussion is, is it okay for Christians to get drunk, you know? And, and here's, here's the thing, like, what, where, do, where is the line between soberness and drunkenness? And, you know, where, where does that actually come? How many pints is it before you arrive there? Or how, many, how many bottles of wine before you actually... And, and so it all becomes... Like, and, and this conversation goes, is it okay for Christians to get drunk? Well, you know, the, the, the thing is, it's possible we could see look at this list of things here that that Paul mentions um, uh, um, uh, revelry and drunkenness and lewdness and lust and envy and strife and and that it might surprise us that Paul even mentions these things he's talking to Christians here he's he's talking to the Christians at the church in in Rome so for some people that's sort of surprising he's even saying you know, to them, you know, it's time to put off this stuff, guys. I mean, poss- it's possible we could see revelry and drunkenness and lewdness and lust as, you know, well, they should be in the list because maybe we see those things as things that are wrong. But then it may be there are uh, other Christians who would say, but envy... I mean, what's wrong with a bit of envy? You know, like, you know, strife. I could, I could see why strife would be on the list, but envy? Of course, when you look at the things that he refers to here, revelry and drunkenness, lewdness and lust, envy and strife, when you think about these things, these are all have, have, have something in common. And and what they have in common is this. If we engage with them, they will take us over to some extent. They have the power to take us over. And they will take take over our heart and our mind and we will be consumed by them. Revelry, drunkenness, lewdness, lust, envy, strife. The one thing they all have in common is that if you engage with them, they will take over your thinking and take a hold on your heart. And all these things will lead us to think or behave in ways that are not fitting for the people of God. That's the point. Not fitting for the children of light. So the advice here is simple. And I didn't know whether to say advice or command. I should say it's a command. And the command is, make no provision for the flesh. That's, that's the command. That's, call it advice if you like, but the trouble with saying it's advice, you can take a, a leave advice. But this you need to do. It says, make no provision for the flesh. In other words, don't open the door to any of this. Don't make provision for any of it. Don't put yourself or allow yourself to be put in a position that might facilitate any of these things. So, for example, if you are invited to a drinking party, then I should say respectfully decline the invitation. Because you, you, you could say, see, well, I could go and not drink. But, but the problem is people would spike your drink and you can end up in that. So just be very careful, that's all. Don't make, don't, you know, open the door to the possibility. Of course, you know, not going to a drinking party is one thing, but of course nowadays it's very easy to go, you know, buy a pile of booze in and get drunk at home, and you can do, you can get drunk at home. Make no provision for it, is the advice, stroke, command. I will say a command. Don't, don't make any provision for it at all. 
Make no provision for lewdness and lust either. You say, but I'm not, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Listen, you, you know, we live in a peculiar age. And I just put it to you that the stuff that comes out of Hollywood, most of it, the content, at least in part, is lewdness and lust. And not just the stuff that comes out of Hollywood either. S television programs, you know. Um, lewdness and lust are part of the show. And you see, the, you see, the problem is, and it's the same in the music industry too. I, when, I, when I used to work in Kerr and some people would put the television on that was in the, in the Kerr home, and they put these mus music, MTV is it, or some music channels on. And some of the stuff on there is pornographic. You know, you're, and you're walking through and it's stuck it's in your face. What, but that's the world we're living in. So the trouble with that is, lust, you see, is something inside. Lust is inside. And it can be triggered by the things that one looks at or watches or listens to or engages with so here it says make no provision for the flesh we must put off all these things and put on christ and the best commentary on this little passage here is is colossians chapter 3 where it says this if then you were raised with christ well if you're a believer you were you were raised with christ okay you are in newness of life so this is for you. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting, at the right hand of God. Seek those things that are above, is what it's saying. And if you do that, you see, you don't, you don't actually have time for Hollywood's garbage. There's, there's something far better to use your time for. And if you, if you put yourself down, you, you don't have time for the garbage, you know, pop music or whatever it is that's full of this stuff. You don't have time for it anymore. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I put it to you that that is the best commentary on what Paul is saying here. Put off the, the rubbish and put on Christ. Amen. You know, seek the things of the Lord, the things that are in Christ, and let the other stuff go. Because all it'll do is drag you, drag you down. Okay, very quickly before we close then, back in uh, Romans uh, um, uh, 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 chapter 13. Do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armour of light. Now if you'll turn with me to First Peter um, and uh, chapter 4. Peter here is really talking about the same thing. And he says, chapter 4, 
Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, same mind as Christ. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these things, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who were dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, as each one has received a gift, Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. And as I said at the beginning, I think we're in for a time of trial. But we should not think it's strange that this happens because actually our brothers and sisters throughout the world are subject to it and some of them have been str struggling with intense trials for many years while we have had it easy. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached, listen, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those things? What will, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator if you are reproached for the name of Christ now if you just flick back to chapter 2 um, it says here in verse 9 you believers are a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who once were not a people but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honourable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. When they speak of you as evildoers... Let me just tell you that back, back in the days of the apostles when this was being written, Christians were often slandered. And, um, and one of the things they were accused of, believe it or not, was cannibalism. You said, what? Where did anybody get that from? Okay, well, imagine, right, you are somebody and you're pretty anti -Christ. You don't like these Christians and you know that they are meeting in this place, maybe somebody's house, and you're listening at the window into a meeting, and then it comes to that point in the meeting where they break bread, and they share together the communion, and they talk about this cup containing blood, drink, and we're all gonna drink it together, and you are listening outside, and, and maybe, maybe somebody reads from John 6 where Jesus talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Okay. So Christians were slandered and called cannibals. 
because they took something that they did out of context and turned it to mean something. Can you see that? And so that rumor spread that these Christians, they vile people. And then, of course, what they used to do, the early believers, they used to have a believers meeting, usually on the first day of the week, in, in which part of it they would break bread, they would share the communion, and afterwards they would have what they called the love feast. So in the Roman world, where people were very uh, promiscuous in their thinking, they would claim that Christ these Christians, the cannibals, and they have orgies. They call them love feasts, they're orgies. And so these rumors spread about the, uh, about the Christian church. And so when he says, when they speak against you as evildoers, that's what he's talking about. They, they're criticizing Christians, to, saying that they're doing things that they never, never did. Okay, well, project forward to our day. And uh, we live in different times. I don't know of anybody who has ever, in my generation, accused Christians of, of those kinds of things. But I see the time coming soon, in fact, I believe it's already come, when they will speak against us as evildoers because we won't take the you-know-what. Even Christians saying that we're evildoers, calling us disease spreaders and murderers and people who don't love anybody but themselves, people who, who are only bothered about themselves and what they want to do. Now, I know of people who have been accused of those very things. You know, and it starts with name calling, anti-vaxxers. This is it's like a, a derogatory term now, isn't it? Anti-vaxxer. You've got Christians calling us anti-vaxxers. Well, I was thinking about that, you know. And you know, in, in, in Greek, the, the prefix anti, it has two, two essential meanings. It can either mean against, or it can mean instead of, or in place of. So we talk, for example, about the antichrist, don't we? And the antichrist, bo both meanings apply to the antichrist. He's against Christ, but he also is one who stands in place of Christ, claiming that he is the Christ, that's the Antichrist. So the prefix anti has these two meanings. And so when they call you anti-vaxxer, I suppose what they mean, at least those who actually think anyway, because a lot of people just, it just trots out of the mouth. They don't even know what they're saying. They just, it's a slanderous word they're using against you. But the ones who use it with any thoughtfulness probably are claiming that you are against vaccination because you don't want this particular one shouldn't have said that word, should I? Probably, mind we're not on there, are we, to, today? Oh, we are, are we? Never mind, never mind. Well, we, we might not be. <laughs> but, but anyway, you know, understand what I'm saying? But, you know, when I thought about it, I thought, well, actually, thinking about what the prefix anti means, I don't have a problem with it. Because, because anti means in place of. So, so I... I don't have it, do you know what? Because I actually have something instead of it. Something that I think's better in place of it. What's that? Well, God, f for one thing, my trust is in God, not in the thing. But I also trust in that that he built into my human makeup that incredible God-given immune system that he's built into me. And so I'm trusting that instead of the thing. So in that sense, yeah, I'm anti-vax <laughs> in that sense. And I'm actually happy to be. Of course, another derogatory term is refusenik. If you don't take it, you're a refusenik. Well, all right guilty is charged. I'm refusing it, not because I'm hesitant, but because I've decided to refuse it because I have this other thing that's actually better than it. It's, it's that God-given immune system, and it's, it's God himself who will keep me here for as long as he wants me here. And when he doesn't want me here anymore, he's going to take me home. And he'll take me home one way or the other, but he'll take me home.
So that's it. So they can call me that as much as they like. I've decided that when the anti-truthers want to call me an anti then then I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay with that. I'll take it as a backhanded compliment because my trust is in the Lord. Okay, that's all I've got to say about that. We, we, we've, got, we've got to think about the times that we're in, folks. I hope Jesus comes today. I hope he comes soon. But if he desires that we should stay here a while longer, then what we've got to do is put off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light, seek those things which are above, not on the earth, have our hearts and our minds filled with him, and do you know what? We're going to be all right. Amen. We're going to be all right. Oh, man, let's, let's just close then with the... Uh,